We have officially ended our study of the periodic table, but we're not done looking at that. We will refer to that periodic table and the elements of the atoms as the need comes through our later lessons. But right now, we're going to return back to something that we did earlier in the school year, actually chapter two, and talk a little bit more about mixtures and solutions, particularly homogeneous and heterogeneous solutions in more detail than we did before. Are we ready to begin? Notes 9a. Here we go. And a quick reminder, now a lot of this that you'll see up here today is definition type material and these should look familiar to you. Homogeneous is a mixture that has the same appearance all throughout that mixture. Now more detail of that is coming up in just a tiny bit, but a quick reminder of what the word homogeneous means. The mixture looks the same all throughout no matter what angle we look at the mixture. And the other one, I'm sure you remember, heterogeneous. This is when the mixture has a different appearance all throughout. We turn something like a rock at different angles. We'll see dirty in one spot, clean in another spot, maybe some different colors or shades of colors. We have some different appearances as we look at that rock or whatever heterogeneous mixture from various angles. So a quick reminder of these two words from a while back. Ready? And now we get into a little bit more detail. A heterogeneous mixture. The appearance is different because in this substance, the mixture has substances that are not evenly distributed. Now it would be better to actually see pictures, but in the chapter there are pictures of what you're about to see in words up here. For example, you know what trail mix is. Okay, you got raisins and maybe some M&Ms and some banana chips and poppy seeds or some other kinds of seeds, sunflower seeds, but trail mix, you grab a handful of that, you're going to see different stuff as you look throughout that mixture. Salad dressings, Italian dressings, oil and vinegar, you might see some different herbs and spices floating around, a lot in one place, not so much in another place. Now we mentioned gravel and rocks many times before. We get different appearances of these substances mixed together as we look throughout the mixture. So heterogeneous mixtures are when the substances are not evenly distributed. Ready? A suspension is a kind of heterogeneous mixture. Okay, what is a suspension? Again, a lot of definition type material today. In a heterogeneous mixture, the particles will separate on their own because the substances are not evenly distributed. Think of something like this. Try dissolving sand in water. Now, water is a universal solvent, meaning many different things will dissolve very well in water, but sand is not one of those things. In sand, if you stir up sand in water, initially we'll get an appearance of the sand being evenly distributed, but take that spoon out and as soon as we stop stirring, much of that sand will sink to the bottom. A little bit will kind of move around in the middle of the water and a lot of it will float on the top as well. So we have a heterogeneous mixture. That's called a suspension because those sand particles, they're not going to mix evenly throughout and they will separate from each other. Again, some will sink to the bottom, some will float on top, and some will kind of swim around in the middle. Other possible suspensions, aerosol sprays. Now it's hard to see inside the can, but think, why do we need to shake many aerosols before spraying? Well, the reason is the particles inside are not evenly mixed. So we shake to get a better mixture before we spray that can, such as air freshener maybe. You've probably seen a root beer float in a glass, the foam at the top, and then the beverage that we end up drinking in the middle and at the bottom, so not evenly mixed. The foam comes from the carbon dioxide bubbles that come out of the top. Mud, there's a good picture of these on page 202, especially the guy who stepped in the mud puddle and has mud all over his feet. And the mud is not always the same color all the way through that amount of mud. I think of airborne dust, maybe in a bright beam of light, you've seen the dust particles floating around. There are more in some parts and less in other parts. 
We mentioned about salad dressings just a moment ago. Oil and vinegar is one kind where herbs and spices kind of float around different amounts at the top, some swimming in the middle, much like the sand water we mentioned just a little bit ago. But page 202 in the textbook will have some good pictures of all of these things. Ready? Okay, another kind of mixture is called a colloid. What is a colloid? Again, more vocabulary coming. This is a mixture, mainly a fluid that has solid materials dissolved, but the particles are so small that those particles won't settle to the bottom. These particles will stay dispersed, but the molecules are so small and separated from each other that we're unable to see those. But there are many, many, many of these molecules. Think of chocolate milk. Now what I'm talking about is the gallon jug of chocolate milk that you might buy at the grocery store. That's been mixed by a machine so, so, so vigorously that those particles are going to stay very, very well evenly dispersed and distributed throughout the milk, those chocolate particles. We can't see the particles. However, because of the mixing, we have a homogeneous mixture. Now, you see that term Tyndall effect. Think of a laser light. Maybe on here you can see where the light's coming off of my remote control there. That's a laser light. The Tyndall effect says something like this. If I were to shine that laser light through a substance, but that laser light gets scattered to the point that we really cannot see through that mixture, we most likely have a colloid. I mentioned that chocolate milk. We'll get something like Gatorade, especially a lighter color of Gatorade. We may be able to shine that laser light all the way through. And in that case, we'd have a solution, which we're going to define next. But a colloid, not necessarily thicker, but something like mayonnaise, that's a pretty thick colloid, will scatter the light and block that light from going through. But something like the light-colored Gatorade, uh, iced tea, that may let that laser light shine through. Those are called solutions. The Tyndall effect is using that laser light to determine if we have a solution or a colloid. Well, we just talked about what a colloid is. Ready? homogeneous mixtures, now we're leading into what solutions are. You saw the word solution on the last page. Quick reminder, in a homogeneous mixture, the same appearance throughout the mixture, so we call that uniform. That's why the athletes on the team will wear a uniform, so they all look very similar and make it easier to identify your own teammates. The same appearance throughout the mixture, and this is called the solution. You're going to see some examples right here. Salt water. We've talked about that before. Stirring salt in the water. Sports drinks, Gatorade. I love to drink coffee. Tea, where I have made up there. That's coffee and tea that's made up, ready to drink. Not necessarily the coffee grounds or the tea leaves. Well, we're talking ready to drink hot coffee and iced tea. And we'll see in a little bit that temperature of the solution will determine how well the stuff we put in there dissolves. Now your sports drinks like a Gatorade, uh, salt water, we may be able to take that laser light, try to get that so you can see again right there, try to get that laser light to shine through and if that light shines through fairly easily then we have what's called a solution but again that light gets blocked, hard to see through, that's more of a colloid. Ready? A little bit more about solutions. The particles are very evenly dispersed through the fluid. That is called homogeneous. Boy, there must be a reason I keep repeating these two words, homogeneous and heterogeneous, and their definitions. All right, now we take the water. We'll use water because water is such a very good solvent. What we put into the water is called the solute. So on the last page, you saw the salt water. So take some salt, stir that salt in the water. The solute is the salt that goes into the fluid. And of course, the water is the fluid. Or coffee grounds. Uh, we don't see too much of this anymore, but when I was younger, we would get instant coffee at the store, and we'd scoop that out of the jar, put it in some hot water, and stir that up. I, I didn't really like it that much, but when I got older and started drinking coffee more, if I didn't have anything else, well, then instant coffee helped. 
We've talked before about stirring sugar in the iced tea. The stuff we put into the fluid is called the solute. The solvent is the fluid that we put the solute in. And that solute does something called dissolving, which simply means the molecules that make up that solute just separate from each other. Now, molecules are very, 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 very small. Okay, in hot water, Gatorade, iced tea, those are the fluids that we put something into to dissolve. So put your sugar in your iced tea. The sugar will be the solute, because that's what we're putting into the fluid. The iced tea will be the solvent, that's the fluid that we put the sugar into. Now those sugar molecules are all built up onto each other and there may be millions and millions and millions of those that make up one grain of sugar that we can see in our fingertip. Dissolving means those molecules simply separate from each other and because they're so small and far enough apart, we can no longer see the sugar. Now hot water is going to dissolve more than cold water will. So if I get hot tea instead of iced tea, I'll be able to dissolve more sugar. Okay, Gatorade is a good solvent. We have other things like electrolytes and in many cases sugar that are dissolved in Gatorade. Right, solutions are when we have a solute, usually some kind of a powdery substance, dissolved in a solvent, usually a liquid. Ready? Okay. Here's a word, salvation. Now we're talking solutions, S-O-L. You just saw solute begins with S-O-L and solvent begins with SOL, so does solvation. This is the dissolving of the solute in the solvent. So a lot of similar sounding words, and I can understand mixing them up when you're not used to these. Water, I said a few minutes ago, is a universal solvent. Water will dissolve almost all little powdery substances, but not quite. Sand will not dissolve in water. Oil will also not dissolve in water but many, many, many other things will. So water is considered a universal solvent. Okay, now this polarized right here. Remember water molecules, put this on the screen here. You know I can't draw, so here's a chance to make fun of my drawing. I have a hydrogen atom here and another hydrogen atom here connected with an oxygen atom here. Now remember hydrogen to make H2O uses up one electron and so does the other one and the oxygen takes those extra electrons for a negative two. Positive one, positive one, negative two is zero. So kind of like a battery. Let's say you got a little AAA battery here. You have a positive end and a negative end. That's called polarized or polar. Now because water is this way, water will conduct electricity, not to that much extent, but pretty similar to a battery. So electricity around water, you have many electrons, through a bunch of water, very, very dangerous and even deadly. But as far as salvation goes, what does this mean? This means the word right here, disassociation. Water molecules attract the particles of solvent and break the bonds of solute molecules. So salt that we put into the water. Since the water molecules are polarized, a positive end and a negative end, well, so are sodium chloride salt molecules, the positive end from sodium and the negative end from chlorine. Now those salt molecules are gonna be separated from each other and that's what dissolving is we mentioned a moment ago. And as those salt molecules separate from each other, now we can no longer see those molecules because of the very, very small size. Now if we warm up the water, heat up that water, we're obviously giving that water more energy so the hot water will be able to break those bonds of the salt molecules from each other even better and better. So hot solvents will allow for more solute to get dissolved. Disassociation is when those water molecules begin to separate the salt molecules from each other because of polarization. Ready? Now solubility, you saw this on a paper we did way back in chapter two. Maximum amount of solute that can dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a certain temperature. At first, that can sound a little bit confusing. But again, think of cold iced tea and hot tea. The cold tea, if we put a bunch of sugar in there, maybe not all that sugar will dissolve very well because there's low energy in the cold iced tea. 
but that same amount of tea at a much higher temperature, think hot tea, will dissolve more of that same amount of sugar that we put in because that hot tea has more energy to separate those sugar molecules from each other. You'll see on page 208, if you have your textbook handy, great. If not, look at the electronic version. You'll see a chart and you'll notice that as we heat up water or water-based fluids, the solubility goes up, not just constantly, but exponentially. The hotter the solvent, the more solubility that solvent will have because the more solute will dissolve. A lot of SOL sounds in all those terms. But again, warmer or hotter fluids have more energy, so they will dissolve more of the solute, separate more of those solutes molecules from each other, and more dissolving will take place. Ready? We're almost done. The rate of dissolving. Well, temperature is one thing that will either speed up or slow down how fast a solute will dissolve. Hotter temperatures will dissolve things faster and more of the solute. Colder temperatures, less of the solute and more slowly. How fast a substance dissolves in water is called the rate of dissolving, or whatever the fluid is. What We talk about water a lot because it's such a common fluid. Dissolving faster when the solvent is warmer, because a solvent will have more energy to break the bonds apart. The solvent is stirred, and the solute also being hotter as well, so both of those could actually uh, cause faster dissolving. The solvent is stirred. The faster, more vigorously that we stir, then the more energy we're putting into those particles, those particles will begin to separate from each other, excuse me, from each other more and more and more easily and therefore faster dissolving. So here are a few things that we can do to speed up that rate of dissolving. Use smaller solute particles because those smaller particles means the molecules, there are fewer of them to separate than, let's say, a small amount of sugar compared to maybe a teaspoon of sugar compared to a tablespoon of sugar. A teaspoon has fewer molecules to separate. A tablespoon is larger, so it will take more time and more energy to separate more of those sugar molecules from each other. So if you want to speed up the dissolving, get warmer solvent and warmer solute. Solvent, stir that faster, and use smaller particles, smaller amounts at a time to get the dissolving rate to speed up. Ready? How do we separate mixtures? There are some mixtures that we can separate, uh, but what about stuff dissolved in a fluid? That would be much harder, but there are possible ways to do that, and here are three of them. Evaporation, this takes a long time. If you stir that sugar in your tea, of course we want to drink the tea, but let that tea sit, let all the water evaporate from that cup. Eventually, the sugar is going to be left behind. Now in this example, we have salt water. Let water evaporate. The solid particles of salt will be left behind, and that's how uh, salt manufacturers can get NaCl, sodium chloride, out of the ocean and into a package eventually so you can put salt on your french fries. Let that water evaporate. The sodium chloride is going to be left alone. Magnetism. Now this one, when I first learned this, kind of threw me, but many cereals have iron in them. Iron is a nutrient that our body needs to help regulate our blood flow. Iron is also element number 26, a magnetic metal. If we can use magnets, we can crush up cereals, get those cereals to dissolve in fluids, and we can use magnets to remove the iron and separate the iron from that crushed up mixture. That has been done. I've seen videos of having it, having seen it done, but I've never actually done that myself. Filtering or sifting. Okay, use something like a coffee filter in the coffee pot. You put the coffee grounds in, in the filter, the hot water runs through, get some of the coffee to flow through, but the filter will block many of the particles so we don't get all those coffee grounds into our cup because that can taste a little bit nasty and gritty. So larger particles are blocked from flowing through a filter. Our bodies have natural filters also. Kidneys filter waste products from our blood. So it's the kidneys, a God-given gift 
that keeps waste from getting into our blood because when bad things get into our blood, even more bad things happen to the rest of our body. So our kidneys filter things out. So eating healthy will help our kidneys function better and then that'll help keep us from getting more serious problems. So evaporation, magnetism, and filtering, which is also called sifting, are three very common ways that we can separate mixtures, things that are dissolved in a fluid. All right, that is the end. And in the next set of notes, we'll talk more about the mixtures and other things that affect dissolving and solvents and solutes. We'll see you then. Good night.